Welcome to the initial webinar for First Easy Pass Lessons from Coach Smith. Uh, we had over 30 some people sign up online to join us and I want to tell you how thrilled I am to have this opportunity to share my reflections of Coach Smith. But before I begin, uh, let me just say a, a few brief words about uh, my website, firsteasypass.com. Uh, this is an idea that I've had for several years and thanks to a good friend, Martin Rose, I was challenged and helped to make this happen. I'll spend some more time at the end of the webinar talking more about our site and how I hope to help coaches, players, and parents. But for over 35 years since I graduated college, I have been repeatedly asked, you know, what was it like to play for Coach Smith? In fact, if, you, if I think back over those decades, the first 10 years I was out of school, the question was, what was Coach Smith like? In the second 10 years I was out of school, which was 89 to 99, the question became, do you know Michael Jordan? And in the last decade I've been out of school, uh, the question became, well, who was the coach when you played? Well, that reflects, unfortunately, how old I've gotten and how long it's been since I've got out of, been out of school. Well, the, the coach I had was Dean Edward Smith, and I'm honored to share these reflections with you. As I share these stories with you, uh, please ask questions at, at any time uh, by typing them into the chat box. I will do my best to answer all those questions tonight. And if for some reason I can't get to them, I'll do my best to get to you tomorrow. For our discussion tonight, I will focus on three areas of my life with Coach Smith. Um, the early reflections of the high school years, the college years, and then the postgraduate years. The early reflections I start off is, is, is talking about the high school years. Um, and what I would like to share here is, is that the, what I call almost making history uh, in basketball. The night Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge came to watch me play, we were playing over at a gym in Greensboro, Greensboro Smith High School. Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge actually walked into the game one, after the game had begun. Uh, you could almost feel the air leave the gym. Uh, for a coach who was not trying to uh, get attention to himself, everybody in the gym, I think most of the players uh, turned and looked at him. And in fact, uh, when I talk about history being made, um, it was not good history. Our team went behind 14 to nothing to begin the game. And I almost felt like, good gosh, Coach Smith's here to watch me play, and I'm going to be on a team that never even scores uh, any, any basket at all. The good news is we didn't make history. We did come back and win. And it was obviously a, a great experience to have Coach Smith uh, watching us play in high school. The second thing I would tell you from high school was the recruiting visit. And what I emphasize here is that Coach Smith early on set expectations. Um, the scene was I had arrived in Chapel Hill on a Friday afternoon and got to watch a little bit of practice and then went with the team um, to dinner that night. Well, there were several of the players for dinner. After that dinner, Coach Smith picked me up and took me back to uh, – the hotel. As we got out of his car, he turned to me and I, I, I wish I could do a great Coach Smith impression, but I can't, so I won't put you through that tonight. But he said, Jed, grab your bags because if you come here, I won't be carrying them uh, for you. That is something that uh, that I think was, was key because he quickly set the expectations uh, of who was in charge. Well, moving forward, it was into the college years and this picture, um, I don't know where that guy went, but um, it was many, many years ago. But uh, Coach Smith uh, had expectations for his players. And those of you that have, that have followed Coach Smith and read much about him or watched him coach over those years, th the main phrase was play hard, play smart, and play together. Um, he really expected the players um, to play and for the coaches to coach. He wasn't interested in having players criticize their teammates. And in fact, he frowned upon that uh, heavily, in fact, made sure that it didn't happen. The other thing he wanted us as, as players was to respect the fans. He saw the basketball program, quite frankly, as kind of the front porch to the university. And as, as a team, whenever we were together, we were expected to dress respectfully and, and treat the folks with respect. And that especially uh, played into folks asking for autographs. Um, though it didn't happen much to me, there were some players that were overwhelmed with autograph uh, request and Coach Smith re required all of us that to to sign those autographs and and treat those fans with respect. And the last thing I would touch on as far as expectations as a player was to keep the game simple. 
Um, you know, he was a math major. And I think from a lot of folks on the outside, his system could look pretty darn complicated. Um, uh, he had a lot of different offenses, a lot of different defenses, and he changed things a lot during the game. And as from the outside, it looked complicated. And I will tell you, as a freshman, it also looked complicated. But once you understood what he was trying to do, it all aligned, it all made sense. And really, his, his idea was to keep the game simple. And what about expectations as a student? He really expected us to be student athletes. We were expected to go to class. We were expected to do our work and, of course, be on time, uh, not only for classes, but, of course, for practice. And the thing I think that, that really stood out for me is he expected us as athletes to also become part of the student body. And what I mean by that was we, we weren't just set apart. Coach Smith had us live, and we, the, the team lived together in a dorm, but it was a, um, it was a dorm with other students, not other athletes, um, and, and he encouraged us to, to get involved in other activities on campus. Uh, I, I was able to join a fraternity. Other players were, were in fraternities, and then other activities on campus. Um, he always encouraged, uh, especially if it didn't get, a, get in the way of your academics and basketball. Those other activities came third, but again, again he expected us uh, to be a part of the student body. One of the things that Coach Smith is so uh, famous for, and for those of you that are listening and, and, and watching and who are, are coaches, I think this is one of the key things you, you want to pay attention to. Coach Smith's practices were always organized. Um, he, he believed that we should all know what we're trying to accomplish that day, and those practice plans were uh, laid out in great detail. Um, every day as a player, we would walk into the locker room before practice and the practice plan would be posted there. We were expected to review that plan, know it, and, and I mean by knowing it, exactly what color jersey you would be wearing on the different drills. He didn't want to waste time in practice. So he spent his time beforehand letting us know by this practice plan exactly what we should be doing. Um, if you're a coach, I'd also pay attention to one thing he did on the practice plan. He gave us a thought for the day and an emphasis of the day. The thought for the day was more motivational or inspirational. And as a player, again, before practice started, uh, we were expected to know what the thought of the day was and what the emphasis of the day was. The emphasis of the day focused on um, a basketball activity, an offensive and defensive emphasis. One of the things I remember is that uh, a defensive emphasis, to give you an example, might be uh, make sure you retreat in the direction of the pass. So every day in practice, uh, every, every time during that day in practice, and anything we were doing, every player was supposed to uh, re retreat in the direction of the pass when you're on defense. If you didn't do it, practice was stopped and, and, and folks ran. Uh, then, of course, you had an offensive emphasis, and it might be something like make sure you box out on every shot. Again, same thing as, as the defensive emphasis. Uh, everything you did in practice, that was uh, watched by the coaching staff. And if not fulfilled, we stopped and, and, and had to run uh, for that mistake. You know, Coach Smith never really talked much about, comp about winning, but competing was very, very important. Uh, practice, everything was measured, and there was a winner and loser in every drill. Uh, I think that's what coaches need to, to do today is make sure that the players understand the importance of, of, of giving their best in every drill they do. So if you can find a way as a coach to have someone help you keep up with the winners and losers in those drills. At Carolina, um, though he didn't, again, talk about the winning part all the time, there were consequences for losing in practice, and that meant usually you're having to run extra sprints at the end of the day. So it, it was a very difficult practice if, if your, your team and your group had lost a lot of drills during the day because that meant a lot of extra running. The key phrase here for the coaches and parents um, working with their, their kids in basketball is the things that get measured get done. Quite frankly, that, that carries over into business too. But they emphasize that you measure, you measure, and you measure, and then there's consequences for those things um, that don't get done the way that the coach wants to get it done. So what was Coach Smith like uh, in the game experience? Well, there's obviously the pregame, and there, then there's the game experience, and then there's the, the postgame. So let me talk a little bit about the pregame. 
I cannot recall in my four years of any uh, pregame talk that Coach Smith gave that was an emotional rah-rah uh, approach to the game. Um, in fact, it was just the opposite. Uh, he was he was non-emotional. He was met, uh, matter of fact about the game. Uh, but the players always knew what to expect. He wasn't up and he wasn't down. Um, he, he was focused himself, and he expected the team to be focused. And, and in fact, I tell this story all the time, and people are, are, are really surprised at how much things were, were structured and focused. Even warm-ups by the team were, were focused. And what I mean by that, you'll see the next bullet point, layup drills, uh, penalties for misses. Coach Smith had a manager in the pregame warm-ups charting which players were missing layups. If you missed a layup, you knew that the next day you had to run an extra sprint for that. So there was a constant um, repet uh, repeating of focus, focus, focus. If you're focused, focused in warmups, you'll be focused in the game. I will say that when I was in school there, sometimes I, I felt like it, some, it might be too much pressure. You know, you don't want to be missing layups now because you, you're thinking about tomorrow's practice. But in reality, it was the right thing to do. One of the things that frustrates me now is to watch a game, whether high school, middle school, or even college, and guys are out there just, just throwing it around, not paying attention. And so as I coach kids today, I give them the same thing. I emphasize focus, 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 because we all coaches have said it, and it's so true. The way you practice is the way you'll play. So what was Coach Smith like at game time? Um, quite frankly, he, he kind of carried the same approach regardless of the opponent. Um, we didn't spend any extra time preparing for Duke than we did, say, playing Rochester University. Um, he took every game the same way. Um, he wanted us to be prepared, and he wants to focus on what we do. He didn't spend a lot of time focusing on what the other team did. Timeouts were structured. Uh, again, Coach Smith, uh, fr from a timeout, um, the team, the guys that were playing all set in the same chairs, the coaching staff would kneel in front of them, and the reserves would would would, would circle around them. Uh, Coach Smith, of well, my four years, what I saw was he remained calm regardless of the score. Um, I think he and his teams reflected that calmness. Uh, as I watch teams today and I watch some of the coaches go crazy up and down the sidelines, uh, I'm amazed that their teams um, don't play that same way. Most of the time they do, but I'm impressed when the coach is going crazy and the team seems to have more uh, composure than, than the coach. So wh what about halftime? Um, I hear folks say all the time, well, God, they made some great adjustments. Well, Coach Smith, what he focused on was reviewing the game metrics. He had a, a, a metric that he used as points per possession. It's now become pretty pretty commonplace in basketball today, but he was way ahead of the curve in talking about that. So we knew ahead of, before the game what our points per, per, per possession goal was and what our goal was to hold the other team to. So he would always spend the first parts of halftime talking about where were we in regards to the goals and objectives we set before the game. Um, he, it was a measured approach. Um, I say up here in the bullet point, he was never upset and what I really probably should have put up there was he never really screamed and hollered. There were certainly times he were upset, but I would tell you he probably used more um, reverse psychology than he did um, getting on us when things were bad and, and praising us when, when, when things were good. He really tried to build the player's confidence and remain positive. And I think as a player, I always appreciated that, um, that we left halftime with a strategy and a confidence that we're going to make things better in the second half. So after the game, you know, most of the time, most of the games, especially when I was there, uh, you know, Coach Smith's teams won. Uh, I think his, his, his actual winning percentage as, as a career was probably 78, 79 percent. So he won most of the time. But what I saw after games was he stayed level headed. Um, he, he, he didn't boast when we won, and he certainly didn't get down and depressed uh, w when we lost. And in fact, most of his um, talking to the team uh, w was saved for the next day or two days later, uh, or the next practice, I should say, as opposed to critiquing us immediately after the game. One of the things he used to say to us, and if you followed Carolina basketball, um, how, how the players responded to the press, the last thing he used to say to us right before the press came in, the, the, the 
locker room was, uh, say something nice about them. Say something nice about them. We might see them again. In other words, let's don't give them bulletin, bullet, bulletin board material. Um, and I think that also exemplified the good sportsmanship he wanted us to play. Not only did he not want us to give bulletin board material, but he wanted us to show respect for those opponents. So how did uh, Coach Smith deal with his players after they graduated, after um, things um, that player could no longer you know, help him win games? Well, I think he became a friend for life. I don't think, I know he became a friend for life. Coach Smith went from being a coach to a friend and an advocate. The, the program he built was more like family. Uh, he cared for his players when they couldn't do anything for him. You know, one of the sh stories I can share with you is my, my senior year was, was, was 1979, and we had won, um, tied for first in the ACC regular season with Duke. We beat Duke in the finals of the ACC tournament. Um, earlier in the year, we had beaten Michigan State with a sophomore by the name of, of Magic Johnson, and we were ranked in the top five in the, in the, in the country. Um, the team was, um, there weren't 64 teams in the tournament back then. In fact, I don't remember how many. Um, so we actually had a bye in the first round and so had a second round game playing over in, in, in Raleigh. Um, for folks that have been around quite a while, that, 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 that game and that weekend or that day became a name as, known as Black Sunday. Duke, um, they had put Duke and us in the same bracket and Duke was playing right at, after us. But we lost to a Pennsylvania team, an Ivy League team, that really didn't have any, re any, any reason to beat us other than they had a very good team, played very well that day, and we lost by one or two. Well, it was my senior year, and my basketball career was over, and we were back uh, riding toward Chapel Hill on the bus. And I've never forgotten this, that uh, you know, here the end of the season had come. Not only had it crushed me because my career was over, but Coach Smith's season was over for a team that really, really had a great chance to get to the Final Four. And as we're riding back on the bus, he walked back to where I was sitting, and he looked at me and he said, Jed, I want to make sure that uh, you, you call the office tomorrow and set up an appointment so that we can talk more about what you want to do for the rest of your life. That always stayed with me because here, you know, uh, though I played as a senior, I wasn't a star player. And his, he had to be disappointed in how we played and how the season ended. But he took the time to start thinking about me as one of his players, not thinking about the season and what can he do for me. That, that continued to carry on he, um, uh, and, and the things that he would do for me. The, the interviews that I got um, for the, in the job world were almost all a benefit of, of him making and reaching out to people and asking um to, to give Jed an opportunity to show what he could do you know, for their businesses. And over those years, and, you know, really until he got sick and, and really couldn't, couldn't communicate with us some more any, anymore in the last few years, he stayed in touch with his players. Um, and he did that in a couple of different ways. Number one, um, at, at Christmas time, we always received the, the media guide and there was a, there was a handwritten note from coach Smith, um, uh, to me, um, most of the time asking about my family. But I can tell you also that what that was, was so good about Coach Smith was he he continued to stay in touch and as your life changed, he stayed in touch. Each one of my, each one of my daughters, uh, when they were born, received a personal uh, letter from Coach Smith. Um, and that's something that they've always cherished. And especially as, as their father and as a former player, uh, I, I can't thank him enough. And, and I would suggest to those of you that are coaches today, you want to make a difference in your players' lives. Find a way to stay in touch after they're no longer on your team. In, in today's world, in the 21st century, with all of the, uh, the technology that you have and how easy it is to stay in touch, I would really, really encourage you to find a way to stay in touch with those players because you're going to look up one day, you know, 20 years later, and that young man or that young woman that you're coaching that's going to come up to you and, and tell you how you made a difference in their life. And, and, and that's what's going to make the difference. You, you won't remember the wins and losses. You'll remember those touches and how those players come back 
and, and, and tell you what a difference you made in your life. So loyalty was a big thing to Coach Smith, and, and, and it worked. It went both ways. He showed loyalty to the players, and his players showed it, showed it to him. So how did he show loyalty to players? Well, I think the biggest thing he did is when you were there as a player, I never, ever, ever heard him criticize a player in public. He, he praised the players in public. When the team won, he gave the players credit. And when the team lost, he took the blame. Um, and as a player, you very much appreciated that. I've always told one story. I remember my freshman year. We didn't lose but four games uh, my entire freshman year. And, and the first game we lost, uh, I remember uh, thinking that night, gosh, I bet practice is going to be hard tomorrow. We didn't play well. He's going to be pretty darn you know, ticked at us. But I looked up and the next morning when I got up and saw the paper and Coach Smith was taking all the, the blame you know, for the loss. And I thought, well, gosh, we're going to be okay. Coach Smith, Coach Smith told everybody what, what a bad job he did. Well, I quickly found out at practice that um, Coach Smith wasn't going to take all the blame. He was going to take the blame in public, but he wasn't going to take all the blame in private. So it quickly became apparent to us, you better be careful in public. Uh, if he's taking the blame, it could be a tougher practice than you think. And I'll just leave this about the loyalty. Um, you know, Coach Smith passed away a few weeks ago, and, and I had the opportunity to attend the funeral um, that was held for the family and former players. And it truly was a testimony to the, to the relationship he built with his players. Um, you know, he coached from the 60s all the way to the late 90s, and I was there kind of in the middle of that. And it was just so impressive and um, so inspiring to see how many players came back to, to show him that respect. And though, though I've never coached for a living, I've coached all my life um, at all different levels. And I hope – that I can, I've made one quarter to one tenth of the uh, of the uh, of the effect that, that that he's had on his players with the people I've coached. Um, it was absolutely um, a marvelous event, and it was a celebration of his life. And um, that funeral, again, what was that testimony for everything that that, that he had in life? Um, at this point, I wanted to take a, a couple minutes to talk to you uh, about um, First Easy Pass and how it's come about and, and, and really what I, I want, how I want to make that happen. Um, and so, so really what it is, it's, it's an online basketball community that I'm trying to build um, for coaches, players, and parents. And it's inspired by the things that I learned from Coach Smith. Um, I, I want to help coaches um, who don't have the resources that a lot of other places have I want to kind of be that virtual assistant, you know, if I if I can, um, to add any value um, to to your program or other people's people's programs. And and I, I plan on doing this by again using the uh, the, the, the 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 different uh, technology of the 21st century. Uh, we're going to have a blog. We're going to have a, a discussion board. We'll continue to have webinars. We hope people will find these things uh, helpful. And uh, especially if we can create some dialogue, uh, you know, through the questions. So, again, I want to emphasize to you, if you have some questions in regards to anything, go ahead and, and, and type them in because uh, I do want to answer those and, 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 and create more of a dialogue. I hope this isn't an entire monologue the entire time. And, and the virtual assistance, what I mean by that is, is, is really being able to um, talk to coaches, um, and help them through practices. This year, I was I was able to help a, a, a young man his first year in coaching, and um, it really was fun for me. I, I think I think it was fun for him, but it was it was really fun for me. And so, the, though he was in a different part of the state, um, I, I considered myself a virtual assistant coach. Uh, we didn't talk every day or after every game, but he gave me different ideas and different things he was dealing with. And, and I was able to have a, a different set of eyes, somebody that uh, wasn't engaged every day with the team. So I didn't even know the players. Uh, so that's been the, the virtual assistant. The other thing I'm going to offer is you go for, these are things I've been doing in the past is individual coaching. So if your parents or players, and especially in the Charlotte area where I'm located, if, if you're interested in, 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 in having uh, some individual coaching, and what I mean by that is, is, is the skill set. 
uh, and the fundamentals. Um, I'm all about doing that. Would be would would welcome the opportunity to 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 work with with your child um, or your team um, if you're in the in the Charlotte area uh, or players from that team, I should say. And the last part of uh, first easy pass is speaking engagements. As I've told you that most of my career, um, I've coached since I left college, but not for a business. I've been in the business world. And one of the things I've done over the years is share these Coach Smith stories uh, with people in the business world. Um, uh, it's amazing how these things carry over. And so what I would love to do uh, and would offer it to you, if, if you have an organization, whether it's business um, or sports oriented, I'm happy to come and, and speak and, 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 and share um, the engagements, the stories, uh, the experience that I've had over the years. Um, so first easy pass is really to simplify the game. Coach Smith talked about first easy pass, make the first easy pass and move. And that was one of the first things I've heard. It's a phrase that stuck with me for over 35 years. And I hope that I can make a difference um, with your teams and your players and, and, and do anything I can, but, but using that phrase, first easy pass. Um, with that, I'd love to open it up for questions. Again, you can type those questions in. Uh, if not, I had some folks send me some questions earlier today, so I can certainly go to those. One of the questions uh, I had earlier today is, what was a hard practice like at Carolina? Well, Coach Smith used to have something called a gut check day. And uh, a gut check day was that we were going to have a full practice. And then at the end of the day, the sprinting would, and, and the sprints that we had to run would, uh, would be double, almost triple sometimes what we had in the past. Uh, no one looked forward to a gut check day uh, because just a normal practice never stopped. You never stopped moving. You kept going all the time. But he wanted to push you. And I think as coaches, we have to push the kids. We certainly have to be careful in today's world if you're coaching a, a middle school or a rec league team and, and know the different shape that your kids were in or are in. At Carolina, he had you know highly trained athletes, but pushing uh, and, and, and those gut check days usually came about twice a year. Uh, we have one question that's come in and says, what do you think were Coach Smith's secrets for staying calm during the game when emotions were running high from players and fans? What tip do you have for coaches to model the calmness for their own teams? Well, that uh, came from Preston Smith. Preston, I, I would tell you that Coach Smith's secret was, I think, is being prepared. He, he did most of his coaching in practice. We prepared, and I can say this, in my four years, I don't think we ever faced a situation in the game that we hadn't prepared for in, in practice. So I think the calmness came from him was that he knew that anything we were facing, that we had prepared for it. It didn't mean it always worked out the way we had hoped, but by golly, he knew he had done his job. And if we went out and executed, things would be fine. And in fact, many times during intense situations, he would say in timeouts, we're right where we want to be. Um, sometimes we used to chuckle and think, well, I'm not sure this is exactly where we wanted to be, but he was making the point, we're okay. Uh, just go out and, and do it. So um, focusing on practice, preparing in practice um, allows a coach to um, be calm during the game. Um, if you haven't done that, then I can see where coaches are getting uh, excited and, and, are, and are not sure what's going to happen. Coach Smith knew what we were going to do. What he didn't know was what would be the outcome of it. I hope that helped uh, Preston. Um, Another question I had earlier today was, um, uh, how much time did Coach Smith spend talking about the other team? You know, in this day and time, you, you go on sites and you listen to coaches and they talk about all the, the pregame um, preparation, all the scouting they do. Well, I know that Coach Smith watched a lot of film uh, of the other teams um, that we were going to be playing, but he really didn't share that with his players. What he really focused on was on us on us executing, doing what we should do. He really felt like, and I saw it, that we had everything we needed to handle any situation that came up if we executed. So the practice time and the emphasis for the most part was, was on the current team. Now, occasionally you might run into a player who was strictly right-handed. He never dribbled with his left hand. 
and we might change some of our principles to offset that player, you know, make him go left. But most of the time, our principles stayed the same, regardless of who we were playing and, and regardless of the score. Um, and so he really spent very, very little time um, with us, anyway, talking about the other team. I can tell you, even in, in the pregame, I, I talked a little bit about pregame. This just kind of popped in my head. You know, when we walked into uh, the locker room for pregame, it was the same thing every day, every every game. Coach Smith would would have written on the board who our starters were, and on across from them were the starters for the other team, and who was assigned to guard them. And then usually what it would say on the board was that guy left-handed or right-handed. For the most part, that was the first time we'd seen that. And so, again, it emphasized, don't worry about the other team. You stay focused on what we do, and, and we'll be fine. So, uh, again, I would say um, that, that uh, you know, Coach Smith really didn't feel the need for to, to burden the team with, with, with talking about the other folks. He spent, again, his time getting us prepared for the, for the games. Um, like I said, I, I do want this to, to be uh, more of a dialogue. So uh, I think we have another question coming in. So, so how did Coach Smith handle big egos from his players? Did he squash them completely, redirect them, something else? Hey, that's a great question. Um, you know, I was probably the exception. Most everybody on the team were high school All-Americans. And so Coach Smith did have to deal with quite a bit of egos. And when I was in school, it goes so far back. Now, a lot of the very young folks listening to this, they're, they're not going to remember this, but I was the fourth class where freshmen were actually eligible, you know, to play on the varsity. So there was really a system still at Carolina where freshmen were, were, were kind of the, the lowest uh, folks on the, on, on the totem pole. So one of the ways he, he dealt with the egos was, well, even as a freshman in your own scholarship, you had to dress in a separate locker room for at least a couple of weeks until you so-called made the varsity. Uh, I'm sure that doesn't go on today. Um, but those freshmen when I was in school were, were, were treated like freshmen then. And again, dressing in a different locker room um, was, was different. And then it, at um, water break time in practice, Sometimes there'd only be five minutes for water break. And what he would do is blow his whistle and the seniors would go get water first. He'd wait a little longer, blow his whistle again. The juniors would go and then sophomores and then freshmen. Some, by the time a freshman got over to grab some water, there might be less than a minute left to go for the water break. So um, you quickly began to understand that, that freshman and, and that ego, you, you better break it. Coach Smith spent a lot of time talking about the name on the front of the jersey as opposed to the to the uh, the, the the back of the jersey, um, but at the same time, he did he didn't squash your confidence. I don't believe he threw a lot at you as a freshman. There were a lot of defenses, a lot of offenses, and of course the seniors had a had a, a, a big advantage because they had been there for three years already. But uh, uh, he made sure you understood your place, and that ego needed to change. Uh, I can also tell you when we, everything we did was, when I was in school, was, was based on seniority as far as how we traveled. Uh, seniors would get to fly first class if tickets were available. Even a six foot freshman would get a first class ticket over a six foot 10, you know, freshman. So that, um, I think that's one way Coach Smith um, dealt, dealt with the, those egos. Now, another question coming in. Uh, and said, will you share the principles, uh, defense and offense? I, I, I certainly plan on doing that. In fact, uh, as we go forward on my blog, um, I'll, I'll be writing more about Coach Smith's principles on defense and offense. But let me just kind of give you a couple things here uh, as, as we talk this evening. Defensively, uh, Coach Smith believed in, in pressure defense. Um, he believed uh, from a position, ball position for you coaches, we, we forced everything sideline. Uh, he wanted to he wanted to keep the ball on one side of the court, not have it uh, do the best we could to keep it from changing sides of the courts. Um, he felt like that would give the defense the advantage if we could get keep the ball on one side uh, and and force sideline. Uh, he believed in pressure man to man, but he also believed in changing defenses. Um, one of the things he would do um, at, at pregame meal uh, after the players finished eating, he would bring all the point guards together. And he called it his quarterback meeting. 
and he would share with the quarterbacks. He'd say, okay, th this, this is the ratio of defenses I wanted. Um, so, and, and what I mean by ratio is, you know, how much man-to-man, -man, uh, how much straight-up man-to-man, how much um, trapping man-to-man, -man, and then how much zone. So the point guard really had to know the ratio that Coach Smith wanted. He might say, hey, I, I want, I want three-to-one ratio, you know, straight-up man-to-man to, to zone. So it, as the point guard had to call those defenses during that first half in particular, he really had to keep in mind, what was the ratio? How many times have we played man-to-man? -man? Uh, let me tell you one thing about also on defense, uh, if people paid attention. Coach Smith, when he was the coach, it was always the same defense under one circumstance. And that is if, if we missed a shot, we were always in straight up man-to-man, -man, always. And I don't even think any TV analyst ever paid much attention to that. The only time he really switched defenses is we're on dead balls and, and made shots. On offensive principle was primarily <laughs> first easy pass. Make the first easy pass and move. No standing. He believed in the motion offense, and he believed in balancing the court, and he believed working from an inside out. The ball should go inside first. Of course, he usually had good big guys, and then you kicked it back out. Kicked it back out. Of course, I played before the shot clock, um, but it was very, very important for us to move the ball three or four, sometimes five passes before a shot went up. He'd, he'd get very upset if we came down and fired up a shot without uh, moving the ball. So offensively, first easy pass, move the ball, make the other team play some defense. Here's another question coming in. It says, how do you think Coach Smith would handle the one-and-done environment and how much control should some handlers have over some of the elite recruits? Wow, that's a, that, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, Coach Smith did have, you know, a few players. Uh, I, the only one that I recall off the top of my head was one and done, and that was actually a junior college transfer. The only junior college transfer that he had was Bob McAdoo. Um, I think Coach Smith would handle the one and done just like he did any other player. If, if, if it was in the best interest of that player to leave, Coach Smith would have encouraged them to leave. Um, I do think the world's changed, obviously has changed dramatically since he first started coaching, uh, and dealing with handlers would be a, be a problem. Um, I don't think he would have ever dealt with handlers. I think what what he, uh, I think that would have probably either forced him out of the game or he would have found another way to recruit uh, in dealing with the parents. My experience was he wanted to deal with the parents. I've always heard him say was if if uh, if, if he could recruit the parents, uh, he knew he had a great chance to get the kids because if the parents had the same values uh, that that he had, uh, he felt very confident. Um, and how much control some ha uh, have over some of the elite recruits? That, that, that's a problem today. Um, there, there's so many people hang, hanger ons. Um, I really don't know how the, the Coach K's and the Coach Williams and, and the Calipari's of the day. Go, obviously, Coach Coach Cal's done a wonderful job um, bringing in these recruits. Um, I, I tell you, you watch Kentucky play, they do share the ball. Coach Cal has done a wonderful job, I think, in, in getting those guys to play together. But uh, you know, dealing with handlers must be awfully, awfully difficult. Um, I'm going to try to help the middle school rec league coaches, so I hope I'm not having to answer any questions in regards to handlers with middle school coaches. But you folks that, that coach out there in that world, um, if, if it's different, let me know, and uh, we'll talk about it together. But that's a great question. That's all our questions for right now. Um, if there are any more, I'll add a couple things. Otherwise, uh, I don't, we're, we're not required to stay on here till uh, 8 o'clock. I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish tonight, and that was just kind of kick this thing off, um, be the first first Easy Pass webinar, and share some of my reflections for Coach Smith. Um, but the ultimate goal at the end of the day is I want to help. I want to help pass on what Coach Smith put in place. Um, it's not, it's not meant to be a Carolina website, but I, I can't hide my upbringing. Um, and I think I learned from, from one of the best, if not the best. And if I can help you in any way, uh, I hope you'll reach out to me by contacting me. You, you see the different ways to contact me at First Easy Pass. Um, I'm building a, getting into this 21st century and building a, a social media. So look for me, look for more videos on YouTube. Look for me uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, and, and Twitter. So be patient with me. I'm the new guy on it.
But again, tonight, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And if there are no more questions, we'll let everybody go and enjoy your evening and get ready for some basketball tomorrow. Thanks again. And remember, make the first easy pass.